Well, this is the Garden City of Christchurch with the Port Hills there in the background. Christchurch today, the scene on a magnificent day for the first rugby league test between the world champion Australians and New Zealand. Here is the match venue, QE2 Park, the scene of the 1974 Commonwealth Games. And as they did 15 years ago, the people of Christchurch have turned out in their thousands today for this great sporting occasion. The playing surface may be just a little soft, but otherwise conditions for the game will be perfect. Now let's meet the two sides with commentator Brendan Telfer. And the Kiwi lineup for this test, which bears little resemblance to the side humbled in the World Cup final nine months ago. Only four survivors from that match, the Iroh brothers, Tony and Kevin, and the halfback standoff combination of Clayton Friend and Shane Cooper. There are two new caps, Tony Kemp, the 21-year-old ex-Taranaki player, now with Newcastle, and the former Cantabrian Brendan Tutor at loose forward, now with the Sydney Club West. Also a different captain, Hugh McGann, who missed the World Cup final through injury, who will lead New Zealand today, playing his 21st test and his sixth as captain. The Australian team with four newcomers to Test Match Rugby League today, so that means nearly a third of the side getting their first taste of Test Match Rugby League. The two newcomers among the backs are Michael Hancock, the fleet-footed Brisbane Bronco. He's on the left wing and still a teenager. The 24-year-old Penrith halfback Greg Alexander, the only non-Queenslander in the Australian backline, having his first Test Match today as well. Another teenage newcomer is the Canberra second rower Bradley Clyde, less than two years out of school, and here he is in the Kangaroo Test team making his debut today. Also, the Queensland hooker, the elusive Kerrod Walters, one of the big stars of this year's State of Origin series. And leading the Kangaroos, that man Wally Lewis, today playing in his 30th Test match. It's a magnificent day here in Christchurch. There isn't a cloud in the sky and a crowd probably in the vicinity of about 15,000, which is considerably more than the Addington Showgrounds can handle. So the decision to shift this test match to a non-rugby league venue, well justified by the New Zealand Rugby League, given the size of the crowd here today. It's a magnificent sight, as QE2 Park always is. It's such a... a delight of colours here with the red chevron track and the rich green grass and the very colourful stand in contrast to so many of the grey bland stadiums that uh, we seem to play so many of our major sporting events in New Zealand but not QE2 Park and the ground as Grant Nisbet mentioned is probably a little bit soft although they played the curtain raiser here this afternoon and here, the, here it is always the most intense and dramatic venue at a test match ground just before kickoff. The front of the tunnel is the two players. Here are the New Zealanders looking very sombre, very committed. They know they have a big job ahead of them this afternoon to atone for that painful loss at Eden Park nine months ago. And the old QE2 roar, which has been dormant, I guess, since the Commonwealth Games 15 years ago, can be heard in full throat at the moment. The New Zealand team getting a marvellous reception. This is only the third occasion in that long 81-year history between Australia and New Zealand that a test match has been played here at Christchurch. And there he is, Hume again, this tall, gaunt figure, the 27-year-old captain of the New Zealand team, playing today in his sixth test as captain. This uh, delightful ritual, which seems to be part of so many uh, big rugby league matches these days, of each player you can see, and each team comes out onto the field with the ball, and they're kicked into the crowd. Now, here come these Australians, these big men. They've got a six-kilogram advantage per man over the New Zealanders in the forward lineup. Three of their team, well over 100 kilograms in size. Peter Moore, the manager of the team, leading them out, and there he is, Wally Lewis. Well, I guess he's used to that sort of reception being greeted with jeers and boos. I guess he feels he's back in Sydney at the moment, leading the Broncos or Queensland. A man who's been under siege since he arrived in New Zealand. He hasn't played any football yet, but he's the focal point of this Australian team wherever they go, on the field and off the field. Everybody wants to talk to Wally Lewis. So this is the scene here at the show at the QE2 Park in Christchurch. And with me I have Frank Endicott. Well, Frank, much has been made about this Australian side and the fact that they should win by 15 or 20 points. What do the New Zealanders have to do to win? 
what they've got to do today is they've got to tackle, they've got to tackle, and they've got to tackle. And they can't, they just can't afford to give the Australian space. If you give this Australian team space, that you're going to be in trouble. They've got to kill the ball in the tackles, and there's going to be a big battle front on with the uh, two sets of props. When you have a look at the job that Brent Todd and uh, James Gording have got trying to master the two big Australian props, a lot is on their shoulders, and they've got to contain them. And in particular, I imagine they have to contain that man there, Wally Lewis, this uh, creative little genius in the Australian side. And here are all these lucky lads who are going to go home with a brand new rugby ball as a result of their visit to QE2 Park this afternoon. 26 rugby balls kicked into the crowd. And so there's 26 very pleased spectators, spectators already. But now it's time for the national anthems from the two countries. And once again, we're going to have a live performance of the national anthems, the old days of the national anthems being piped out over the public address system or some scratchy disc seem to have gone. And today it's the Burnside High School Choir led by the choir master and conductor. Mr. Peter Rowe, there he is to the left of the picture, who will conduct the Burnside High School Choir in the singing of the two national anthems. Meanwhile, the two teams are being introduced to a series of uh, dignitaries on the two field, on, on the field, the Mayor of Christchurch, Sir Hamish Hay, and the chairmen of the two rugby leagues, Mr. Bill Hunter from Australia, Mr. George Rainey. There's Mr. George Rainey to the left. Sir Hamish Hay, the Mayor of Christchurch. And also there is Mr. George Hunter, the Deputy Chairman of the Australian Rugby League, along with the representative of the sponsorship company, New Zealand Breweries. So the scene set here for the two national anthems, there seems to be some slight delay as the dignitaries continue to meet the remaining members of the New Zealand lineup. but we'll be back with the national anthems in just a moment. And we still have a little bit of pomp and ceremony to get through before the uh, football gets underway. The two teams are yet to be introduced to the crowd. Each member of each team is introduced and we still have the two national anthems to be played, but still the dignitaries uh, walking up and down the field. They've spent some time, the best part of about five minutes, with the New Zealand team. And now the Mayor of Christchurch, Sir Hamish Hay, is being introduced to the Australian team, along with George Rainey and Mr Hunter from the Australian Rugby League. There's Kerrod Walter playing in his first match today. Tony Curry, one side of him, Michael Hancock. There's Gary Belchett and Paul Sinanen. Mel Meninga and the four reserves, Michael O'Connor and little Des Hasler, the New South Wales standoff half. There's big Mel Meninga, number three. And it's, I imagine, a uh, big occasion for the Meninga household, but I imagine loyalties are also somewhat divided here today because Mel Meninga's wife is a New Zealander, Debbie Meninga, who comes from the town of Patia. And he's a regular visitor to New Zealand. He was telling me yesterday in his hotel how much he enjoys bringing the family back to New Zealand a couple of times a year and getting away from all the hype and exposure in Brisbane and having some peace and quiet with his in-laws in the little South Taranaki town of Patia. These big Australian forwards with uh, an average weight of 97 kilograms, which is six kilograms per man heavier in the New Zealand forward lineup. Two national anthems from the Burnside High School Choir.
And so the scene now just about set for the start of this uh, 73rd international between these two countries. Uh, but now we have the players from the two teams introduced to this crowd of 15,000 people here. And it's an unusual experience, I suppose, to have so many players in an international match all coming from the one competition. And this may not necessarily be state versus state rugby, but it certainly is still mate versus mate, because 22 of these 26 players here this afternoon involved in this international, of course, play their rugby in the Sydney competition. So they certainly know each other well. Brent Todd, for example, the New Zealand prop forward, who has uh, three of his Canberra teammates in the Australian side. Daryl Williams, the New Zealand fullback, with a couple of his manly club mates in the Australian team but now the tossing of the coin and it looks like uh, Wally Lewis has uh, won the toss and has decided to play from left to right in the first half and Red Limited presents live coverage of International Rugby League New Zealand against Australia so Lewis, having won the toss, has elected to play with the Senators back in the first half. Uh, now he also has the advantage of a slight wind, although there's not much wind here, despite the, the fact that that flag that you saw during the National Anthem appeared to have a good flutter on it, but that was high above the stand, down here at playing level. There isn't much wind at all. The ground in very good condition compared to what these Australians in particular have been used to in Sydney this year. In fact, I imagine they think they're probably playing on the Nullarbor Plains or somewhere at the moment. This ground will be so dry and hard compared to the state of most fields in Sydney over the past two or three months. Well, we're about uh, three or four minutes already behind the schedule start of this match. It was due to get underway at 2.35. It's now nearly 2.45, in fact, as the introductions to the crowd continues. When you look at the, the difference in size of these two sides, the Australians are definitely a lot bigger, approximately uh, 10 kilos per man in the forwards. But uh, New Zealand today have got to rely on mobility and speed. So we're nearly through the introductions, and the New Zealand players, hey, they are really pumped up. They really just can't wait to get into this match. The Lion Red New Zealand Kiwi, number one fullback, Daryl Williams. Here's Daryl Williams, the manly fullback back in the New Zealand team today. Left wing, number two, Tony Hero. Right centre, number three. There Tony he is, Hero. a man who's carrying a big burden on his shoulders this afternoon. One of the hottest properties in rugby league. That's Kevin Hero, number three. This big 16 stone centre. Shane Cooper out to the right and Clayton Friend, his halfback inside of him, wearing number seven, the 27-year-old Clayton Friend, playing in his 19th test today. And there's uh, Big Brent Todd, 24-year-old, the heaviest of the New Zealand forwards at 97 kilograms. And one of the few players who doesn't play in the Sydney competition, that's uh, Barry Harvey, the 24-year-old Wellington captain, hooker in the New Zealand team today. Sam Stewart, captain of the Newcastle team, playing at his ninth test today, the ex-Wellington policeman. Kiwis will be looking for a big game from him today as well. And the referee this afternoon, there he is in the centre of the field. That's Mr Ray Tennant from Castlefoot, conducting his first test match, his most prestigious appointment so far was this year's Challenge Cup final. A man who's a rather wealthy individual in his own right. He owns a chain of mini supermarkets in Great Britain. Comes here with a very big reputation nonetheless. And Kevin Hero starts this test match only the third time in 81 years it's been played here in Christchurch. And Gary Belcher, this attacking Australian fullback, takes him and a heavy tackle on him, 15 metres out from the Australian line. Clyde, the newcomer. The New Zealanders, I'm 
sure, very aware of the number of mistakes they made in the first 20 minutes of that match at Eden Park and will be very keen to close the Australians out and hit them with everything they've got. But Wally Lewis made an interesting observation on Friday in a television interview with uh, Channel 10 in Australia. He believes this New Zealand team, unlike the World Cup side, has not been chosen for its aggressive skills, but its footballing skills. So it'll be interesting to see if there is, in fact, a, a change of tactics on the part of the New Zealanders here running with the ball for the first time in the match. Inside their own half. This is Tony Eroff. He makes play up 10 metres. Still inside the New Zealand half. Charge from Brent Todd. Barry Harvey, dummy half. On halfway in the first two minutes of this match. Sam Stewart takes it up into the Australian half. <coughs> Taken in the tackle by Kieran Walters. Harvey again. And the referee is called for the scrum for the ball. Lost forward. An early mistake there from Brendan Tudor, but uh, he'll, he'll be settling down. He's, he's fired up out there at the moment. It's vital that these big forwards make their yardage plays. And Clayton Friend leaves the ball behind. I think he might have knocked, knocked it forward as well in his uh, fumble of the ball there, and so the Australians get the loose head inside the New Zealand, inside their own half. And the referee looks like he's penalised the New Zealanders. This is the sort of thing that referees do early in a the game. They try and show their authority, and it, it happened in the World Cup final. It's happening here again today. Uh, they they stamp their authority on the match early. They pointed the finger at. Uh, one of the New Zealand props, I think it was Brent Todd, for something that he saw as the scrum was going down. So the Australians, and this is big Sam Backer, the heaviest man on the field at 108 kilograms. Karen Walter. Steve Roach, out of favour with the New South Wales selectors, but in the Australian side this afternoon, Wally Lewis. And the ball fumbled there by Paul Sidonen in New Zealand. Get the loose head. So there's an early mistake from the Australians as well as... Little Clayton Friend has a word to say to Sirenin, and the New Zealanders get a penalty. Little Clayton Friend, he wasn't going to allow this big fella to get the better of him. There he is. Well, I guess if you like your friends fractious and fiery, there's your man. Very impressed with the way the uh, Kiwis uh, are getting up in the defensive line. They're getting up and moving up quick on them. So from the free kick, 10 metres inside the Australian half. No score in the match, which is uh, four minutes old. James Golding. There he is, number 10. Playing only his second test match. And Shane Cooper looking for Tony Kemp, but the gap was too wide, and so he elected to take the tackle himself. And the New Zealanders making their way up to the Australian quarter line. Barry Harvey. Back to Brendan Tutor, one of the two new caps in the New Zealand team, Sam Stewart. And Stewart stepping through one tackle. And the little grubber click from Clayton Friend. And the Australians in trouble. Hancock, the teenager in the Australian team, getting his first touch of the ball as a wall of black jerseys swallow him up a couple of metres from his own goal line. And the New Zealanders up offside, up inside the five metre mark while the ball was being played. And so the Australians receive a penalty just at 10 metres from their own line. Still a feeling out fe uh, period at the moment, and this will carry on for the next five or 10 minutes. But the, the Kiwis are looking good at this stage. And the big charge from Steve Roach, the man they call the blocker, to Walters. And a little fortuitous there for the Australians as the ball went off back over. Coming through was Bradley Clyde to take the ball. So Australia still with possession. Wallace, uh, Lewis on halfway. And there he is, this very aggressive fellow, Brendan Tutor. Buries Wally Lewis. And Australians moving the ball wide for the first time and Bradley Clyde almost stepping out of the tackle there. Vorton, the vice captain in the Australian team. Makes five metres. Four tackles. And Lewis kicking on the fourth tackle. Back there is Mark Elia, ten metres from his own line, having a little bit of a run. There's a bit of a gap here for Elia. 
crunched by Becco and Lewis on the quarter line. Daryl Williams, the fullback, can't get away from Wally Lewis. Brent Todd. Brent <laughs> Cooper. And what does Mr. Tennant say about that tackle? It looked a little high. Tony Kemp was underneath it, and he's not well. It was a high tackle there, but he slipped into it, and he's definitely hurt out there at the moment. He's not looking too good. And we'll have a stoppage here. A penalty against the Australians. They've been caught offside again. And meanwhile, Tony Kemp is receiving some attention. Let's have a look at that tackle again. He looked as if he might have slipped as he was going into the tackle. And there's Wally Lewis. Well, I'm not altogether sure whether it uh, was Lewis that uh, deliberately made contact with Kemp. He seemed to slide and lose his footing as he went into the tackle with Lewis. But he has suffered an injury. Meanwhile, play continues with Daryl Williams taking the penalty from halfway. Tony Kemp has rejoined the, the match after some attention from the New Zealand physio, Glenn Gallagher. Clayton Friend, no way past Paul Borton. The runners just weren't there then. They should have been there. That was a planned move. Taken up by Golding. Ten metres inside the Australian half. Still no score on the match. And here's Kevin Edor with his first real chance in the match. Edor gets away from one tackle. This big man, look at him. It takes one, two to get him down. It's Tony Curry that eventually made the tackle. Hugh McGann kicking for the corner flag. Gary Belcher, it's an awkward one. He takes it a metre from the line. That's a good tackle from the New Zealand captain. He made the kick and he also made the tackle. Putting pressure on the Australians on their own line. Hancock. He hesitated before he elected to pass. And again, the ball has gone loose and the Australians being subjected to some pressure here from the New Zealanders. Good stuff here from the Kiwis in the first 10 minutes. Yeah, great, great football, New Zealand. Brendan Tudor's getting into these players and they don't like it at all. I can see now why they call him the baby face assassin. Wally Lewis will know what he looks like by the end of the match. There he is, number 13, the New Zealand loose forward. Now New Zealand with the ball, Kevin Eero just 10 metres out, looking to go on his own. Friend laying the ball to Sam Stewart. That's the New Zealand try line, they're only a couple of metres away. Friend, the long pass to Kevin Eero again. Couldn't free the pass to Mark Elia. Clayton Friend, a dummy half. Kevin Eero to Cooper, back to Friend again. <laughs> no way for the little fiery fella through those big Australian props. Todd to Kemp, moving the ball wide, but the pass was a poor one to Sam Stewart. Yeah, the nerves are starting to go now, and they're starting to fire the ball around. It's loosening up a bit. We're going to see one great match here today. Well, this is certainly a better start by the Kiwis in the first 10 minutes than we saw at Eden Park nine months ago. the ball going loose and diving on it one of those New Zealand forwards but I think they might have been offside yeah, it looks as though Brendan Tudor broke from the scrum too quick so Australia received a penalty from Mr Tennant inside their own quarter line free kick. Becco takes play up to within 10 metres of halfway. Walters to Steve Roach, the big 27-year-old Belmain prop. Bradley Clyde, the 19-year-old from Canberra, within 7 metres of halfway. No score yet with 11 minutes of the match gone. And here's the first real break as the Australians move the ball wide and it's gone loose. The break made by Paul Surinan, but Australia losing the ball. Surprising to see the Australians with such good ball skills and such a good scoring opportunity fumbling the ball there. This is what happens when you give them space. This is what happens. Have a look at it. Big Paul Surinan busts two tackles, three tackles, and gets the vital pass away, and Fatty Vorton's there to back up. 
and then the straight pass there. Good work, Hume, again. Yeah, mate. Yep. But New Zealand receive the penalty. Now they take the free kick inside the Australian half. You just have to be so quick with these Australians if they get, they see half a gap, they're gone. This is what happened at Palmerston North on Tuesday night. They have this marvellous ability to seemingly create something out of nothing, as we saw then. And it was really only that to spill pass that saved New Zealand's bacon. Could be early points here for New Zealand. So New Zealand ahead in the penalty count, 5-3, to three, and here is an opportunity for Kevin Iro to put the first points on the board from a very handy position. Yes, you see both teams using the block ploy uh, here where they uh, put the decoy runner through and give it to the wide runner on the outside, and this is effective. And, of course, there, Greg Alexander, he's pulling the ball away, and that's an offence. It's, uh, it's uh, two points coming up here, hopefully. So watch number seven, Greg Alexander, as he makes the tackle and then doesn't allow the player to get up with the ball as he pushes it out of his arm and Kevin Iro now has a chance to put the first points on the board just the start the Kiwis wanted Kevin Iro swats the penalty and New Zealand ahead by two points to nil after 12 minutes of play in the first half Kevin Iro, who scored 20 points in his test debut back in 1987 against Papua New Guinea, and he'll be doing the goal kicking for New Zealand today. Wally Lewis restarting from halfway. This is his brother Tony Iro playing on the right wing, but he's lost it forward. That's bad from Tony Iro because the Australians now are just 15 metres from the New Zealand line. This is their best opportunity so far. They're really the first time they've got inside the New Zealand quarter line. No way through there for, for Lewis. And that could well be a penalty. And it's on here on the side. She's on for one all. Well, I think there might just have been a slightly over-vigorous uh, play there by the couple of the Kiwis on Wally Lewis. Yeah, Brendan and his Tuda. teammates were quick to come to his defence. Brendan Tudor, he's got his eyes on Wally Lewis. And, and, and with, I know Brendan well, and with the, the bigger the names come, the bigger the hits. And he's really giving uh, Wally Lewis a hard time out there today. Watch him number 13. Just watch him, yeah. Here he comes. Now in comes Tudor now. And hey, hey, that is really just a wee bit too aggressive from yeah. Brendan Tudor, the Chatham Islander. Yes. And he's been penalised. There he is, the man making his test debut today, born in the Chatham Islands. In fact, uh, a big plane load of the locals have flown into Christchurch today to cheer their lad on. But he's just going to have to curb some of his aggression. Controlled aggression is the name of the game. Mel Meninga with a shot at goal probably even slightly easier than the one that Kevin Iroh had a few moments ago and this should level the scores Meninga who celebrated his 29th birthday yesterday playing today in his 20th test match a simple kick for the big Queenslander and Mel Meninga evens the score after 13 minutes of play. But for all that uh, indiscretion from two to Frank Endicott, the Kiwis, I think, could be reasonably pleased with their first 15 minutes of this match. They can feel very pleased with the first uh, the first 13 minutes of this match. They're playing good football out there and they're in with a big chance today. If they keep busting these Australians, they'll get them upset. Just a silly little errors like that that are going to cost him. Clayton Friend penalised, and the Australians receive a penalty inside their own quarter line. Wally Lewis, who will kick for touch. And the penalty count evened up to five apiece, with that penalty going to the Australians. Walters with the free kick. To Steve Roach. Back to Walters. Backo running on at pace, breaks out of two tackles, big Sam Backo, 17 and a half stone of him. You've got to watch this fellow. Vorton. 
Paul Vorton, who captained the Australians for the first time in the match at Palmerston North on Tuesday. Walters to Alexander. Gary Belcher, the fullback, runs into Sam Stewart. Ten metres inside the New Zealand half. Walters. And again, it's the big prop forwards that are running off these first plays, and the Australians trying to move the ball quickly. But a very good tackle by Shane Cooper on Vorton there. Didn't allow the Australian vice-captain to free the pass. And the ball eventually knocked forward. So the scrum to go down just two metres inside the New Zealand half. The score's level at two all. Penalty apiece. Friend to Cooper. To Kemp. Couldn't free his pass to Mark Elia. Surinan made sure of that. Mark Elia, who's had very little to do in the match so far. Taken on by Brent Todd. Back to Harvey. Shane Cooper. Hugh McGann just trying to slip through that gap. Taken by his opposite number, Sidonin. 10 metres inside the Australian half. And Hugh McGann is lying on the ground. Doesn't look too good at the moment. But as the Australians move the ball wide and a long, long wide pass from Wally Lewis. Getting it as far as Hancock. Tries to get away. And he does get away from Sam Stewart. But James Golding comes quickly in and takes this. The youngster, 10 metres outside his 22. That could well be a penalty. Looked a little high. The referee has a word with the man who did it, Brent Todd. Explains that that's over the shoulder line. Let's have a look at it again. Tony Curry, and in goes Brent Todd. Too high, penalty. Fair penalty there. You've got to keep the tackles down. That was far too high. I'm very impressed with the New Zealand back three at the moment. They're tackling their, their hearts out. Now in comes Hancock, and he just about got away from the tackle of, of Sam Stewart. Just got him with the ankle tap. Alexander, Lewis, the Australians moving it fast, as far as Borton, buried by Hugh McGann. Ten metres outside the New Zealand quarter. Roach. Bradley Clyde couldn't get his big frame through that little half gap that he spotted. Alexander again. Lewis. And what oh, Wally Lewis? He's going to have a little run on his own. Makes it to the quarter line. And now some real pressure coming from the Australians. Here goes big Paul Sidonin. But he really ran off the support there. They're only a matter of 10 or 12 metres from the New Zealand line. Roach. Steve Roach looking for some support. Alexander, there's a gap here. Alexander, and yes, is that the first try? Tony Curry gets it. An air of inevitability about that is wave upon wave of Australian attack. And it was eventually Tony Curry there to finish the movement off. And Australia take the lead from by six points to two. This was the final play. Steve Roach with a little dummy which confused the New Zealand defence. Eventually taken in the tackle. But then the Australians had the numbers. Alexander, as far as Tony Curry and the Queenslander in the 19th minute, scores the first try of the match. Yes, an excellent, an excellent build-up here from the Australians. They hit the short side here. You'll see the ball go out here from Alexander to Curry and Curry in on the corner. Good, good, good work there from Steve Roach too. But the build-up happened 30 metres out. They worked it out 30 minute, metres out, then hit the short side, and they, New Zealand were vulnerable there. So Meninga with this a very difficult conversion from just a, a half a metre in from touch. This to make it 8-2. subjected to early pressure by the Kiwis find themselves with a six-point lead. OK, let's see how Howie Tumity felt about that try, looking at it from down there on the touchline. Howie? Well, 20 minutes gone, uh, Howie, and uh, what are your thoughts so far? Well, I thought they started well, but they're just going too high in their tackles. They've got to get around their legs. They're, they're moving up, they're going forward well in their, uh, when they're driving the ball up, but they've got to go low. They can't keep flying around their head, they'll just fall off.
So from the restart, uh, Dale Shearer plays it back to Sirinan, who has this um, ability we've seen already of stepping out of a tackle just when you think you've got him, using those long legs of his to wriggle himself free. He nearly did it again then. Good play there by Steve Roach. Freed the ball in the tackle with one arm. And the Australians starting to look ominous. Belcher. Using these big men to charge at the New Zealanders, trying to wear them down with their superior weight and strength. Bradley Clyde it was there. And the kick to Wally Lewis. And a little fortuitous that uh, Gary Belcher was backing him up. Walters. Bradley Clyde again. This is the young man who at 19 years of age is being tipped as one of the real bright prospects of Australian Rugby League. Only second year out of school. Bought and left it behind and the New Zealanders dive on it. James Golding that pounced on the ball as the New Zealanders spin it wide. And a big tackle on Kevin Ito from his opposite number, Meninga. Mel Meninga who hasn't had much to play in this match so far, apart from his kicking. Back out to Walters. And get away from Todd. Sirenin again, who's becoming a key man in this match, along with Clyde. Those two second rowers and those two big prop forwards from the Australians. Wally Lewis doubles round, and here's Clyde again. There's room for the big second rower. A superb tackle, however, by Hume again from behind. Kevin Ero, a little lucky to gather on the ball after looking a little suspect under the bomb. The referee has given a penalty to the New Zealanders. Very impressed with the referee up today. He, he's doing a good job out there. I see both both teams are actually cringing inside that five meter mark. He's giving him a glare, you know, a bit of eye contact, and he's not blowing the game up like a lot would. And he's I'm very impressed with him. Well, he does have a, a reputation. I think they call him the ghost because of the lack of presence he likes to impose on a match, and that's what we're seeing from him this afternoon. It's James Golding, no way through that wall of green jerseys. I think he might have lost it as well. So the Australians win it. Steve Roach moves it as far as Greg Alexander. The New Zealand have suffered seven drop balls in the first 20 minutes of this match. That's unfortunate. The Australians, in turn, have lost the ball three times when they've had possession. Belcher tries to get away from Kemp. Surinan again. Surinan gets away from one tackler, makes it up to halfway and frees the pass. Good play from Surinan. He really is having a big game. Alexander to Roach. Roach, he just doesn't have the speed of uh, Surinan, so giving the New Zealanders a little more time to make the tackles on the big Belmain prop. Lewis again. Into the arms of Mark Elia on the quarter line. Wally Lewis makes the tackle. Some of these New Zealand forwards are showing signs of tiredness at the moment. Daryl Williams, who hasn't had much to do so far in the match, running from fullback just outside the New Zealand quarter line. The Australians are hit by eight points to two. Try in the 18th minute by Tony Curry. Friend to Kevin Edor. Gets out of the tackle of Meningas, gets away from Lewis as well. Alexander tries to get him around the neck, and Alexander, lucky that he wasn't penalised there, he deliberately went in around the neck, however. Tony Kemp. Kemp breaks out of one tackle, where's the support for Kemp? Gets the pass as far as uh, Hume again inside the Australian half. Better stuff here from the Kiwis. And Daryl Williams trying to bounce the ball into touch and does do so as well. Good work there from both centres, both running good, hard and fast. Kevin Iroh is just stamping his class on this game at the moment. So the scrum going down about five metres outside the Australian quarter line on this, the near side. Alexander. 
And a good tackle on by Clayton Friend. And New Zealand win possession as well. That's better stuff. To Cooper. To Sam Stewart. Back to Harvey. Todd. 15 metres from the try line. Harvey again to friend Cooper. McGann. Barry Harvey. Four tackles gone so far. And the little grubber kick from Clayton Friend of the chase is on, but it was always covered there by Dale Shearer on the left wing for Australia. The chase given by Tony Kemp. It's the first time the Australians have been under any pressure since the first five minutes of the match. Yeah, the line drop out here. We're going to get six plays inside their half. This is when we must turn it into points. 26 minutes have gone in the first half. Australia are ahead by eight points to two. The Australian skipper Lewis with the goal line dropout. It's a very good kick from Lewis, getting plenty of yardage, bouncing the ball back inside the New Zealand half. Tony Iro, and using every ounce of his 95 kilograms to make play up 10 metres inside the Australian half. McGann. Looking a little groggy and not looking too good, Hugh McGann, who's had a couple of knocks so far in this match. And he looks as if he's suffered a knock to his ribcage. He's getting some attention there from the New Zealand physio as play continues. New Zealand could ill afford to lose the services of this man, this inspired leader, Hugh McGann. And Clayton Friend gathering up the loose ball, but I think he might have knocked it forward first. Mr. Tennant is called from the scrum. So an anxious sight there for Kiwi eyes with Hugh McGann, whose presence was sorely missed in that World Cup final last year. And Mr. Tennant decides we'll have a break. So at the moment, the penalty count is uh, six all. New Zealand having suffered eight drop balls to the Australians five. And looking at the tackle count, which makes an interesting reading, it's been Hugh McGann, the man that's getting the attention from Glenn Gallagher, that's leading the New Zealand tackle count with 11 so far. Sam Stewart's made 10. Brent Todd has made 10. And in the Australian camp, it's been Paul Borton with the highest tackle count so far of 11 from the first 28 minutes of this match. And Hugh McGann, who would like to score, I'm sure, a, another try today to give him a share of the test match record for tries and tests by a Kiwi of 15, presently held by Philip Orchard. Belcher from fullback to Meninga. And they have to close that gap quickly on the Brisbane Bronco. Well, he's now, in fact, playing for the Canberra Raiders, the Queenslander, Mel Meninga. Inside the New Zealand half. Steve Roach again. Still only one try in the match so far, with just over 10 minutes of play remaining in the first half. Greg Alexander. They've been watching him like a hawk. He had such a good game in Palmerston North. He's so dangerous can play the ball. Three tries he got against the President's 13. The Australians have been penalised. Someone chipped the referee. I think it might have been Alexander. No, it was Steve Roach there. He, he had a go at Daryl Williams, threw a couple of punches at him, and he got he caught two or three back too, mind you, and uh, he said something to the referee, and New Zealand have got the penalty. Now, it's uh, just a metre inside the Australian half, but it appears to be beyond the range of Kevin Ero, and so Williams, the fullback, will take the penalty kick and kick for touch. <laughs> and, well, he's found it, but he certainly didn't make much ground. Just a couple of metres up the touchline. But, however, New Zealand with six tackles. Barry Harvey trying to go underneath those Australian defenders. And Tuta to Sam Stewart, running at pace, making 10 metres. 10 metres outside the quarter line in centre field. Australia ahead by 8 to 2. Cooper to Kemp, back to Cooper. Clayton Friend, 
New Zealanders keeping the ball alive. Williams from fullback. Clayton Friend again. Moving it wide to Tuta. Gets the ball as far as Tony Iro, who darts back infield. And the New Zealanders are certainly keeping the ball alive, but they're not making much progress up the field. Iro loses the ball, and Australian come away. Australia come away with it. Alexander to Wally Lewis. To Belcher. Belcher gets away from two tackles. Meninga across to Hancock. I notice a lot of the running in this game is going across the paddock and not up. And, the, 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 you know, these forwards have got to think about their yardage plays. You be, before you throw a wide ball, you must make your yardage. You know, it started off forwards taking three, four plays up and then throwing a wider ball. And at the moment, it's just getting a little bit loose. Good stuff from Darrell Williams as he makes 15 metres up the field. Tuta carries it on inside the Australian half. The New Zealanders looking for their first try of the match. It hasn't come so far. And the, the whistle is gone. An injury to Paul Borton. And he's having a word to Brent Todd. We might have a look at that again. And Tuta, I think, is going to be penalised. It's the second time Tuta's been singled out by the referee for over-vigorous play. Yes, I think you'll find here he just lashes out with a booter and uh, gets Paul Vorton, I think it is, or the knee, is it? Yeah. Just watch it here. Bit of a shove. Yeah, he had a right knee in the face of Paul Vorton and uh, just a, an act of undiscipline there. Now, Tutu will be on borrowed time if he continues with those sort of tactics. That's twice he's been singled out for clear indiscretion. OK, he's fired up and he's pumped up. That's good, but there's really no room or need for that. And his first indiscretion cost two points. This time it's inside the Australian half, so Lewis will just kick for touch. But it was an obsession, I guess, with those sort of tactics that cost New Zealand dearly in the World Cup final. They really have to concentrate on playing football rather than playing the man. However, from the restart, Roach... Good tackle by Sam Stewart on Roach. Walters goes the short side with Alexander. And the ball, in the opinion of the referee, was not lost forward. It rolled across the field, and so the Australians continue to Alexander to Clyde. Couldn't get his pass for an in. Goes Brendan Tudor again with plenty of vigour. Sirenin. This is the fifth tackle coming up. Lewis decides he'll drop for goal. It makes something of a hash of it. Yes, actually clipped uh, by a New Zealand player on the way through, and that's a line dropout. It's unfortunate. So only one try so far in the first... 31 minutes of this match, scored by Tony Curry in the 17th minute. The try converted by Meninga, he's also kicked a penalty. And Kevin Edor started the scoring with a penalty for New Zealand. As Darrell Williams with a big goal line dropout, carrying the ball on the full into the Australian half. Taken by his opposite number, Gary Belcher. Shane Cooper makes the tackle on him. 10 metres inside the New Zealand half. Alexander manages to get his pass to Surinan. Pushes off. James Goulding and makes play up almost to the quarter line. Yeah, Paul Seren and he's coming into his own there. He'd be the player of the match up to this stage. Walters looking for Tony Curry. This elusive Queensland centre. Away goes Curry. Must be a try to Lewis. Oh, great play from the Kangaroos. The two Broncos, Tony Curry and Wally Lewis, combined superbly there to completely hoodwink the New Zealand defence. And the second try of the match coming in the 32nd minute. And just watch this man, Curry. He is so elusive. The pass fed to him from Walters. 20 metres out. He steps out of one tackle. He steps out of another. The big gap opened up. And there he was, his skipper, Wally Lewis, on hand to take the pass. Eero came too late. And Wally Lewis gets the try. It's 12 to 2.
Yes, good try for it to Australia here. You see Walters moving across the ruck. Wide pass to Curry. Beautiful footwork by Curry, but look at the missed tackles. All going too high. And the final pass again, and who else? Wally Lewis. What a master. There he goes. Be a good six-pointer, this, for Australia. New Zealand have now got to regroup. They've got to get their composure back. They've got to get back into this game. Meninga from a handy position makes it 14 points to two and the Australians now with a 12 point lead with half time just a few minutes away we might have a look at that try again just look at the footwork of this uh, Brisbane Bronco he really did jink and dive all around the show but as Frank Endicott said where were the New Zealand tackles where was the defense it wasn't at home and Lewis with a very simple run in once he received that pass Curry did all the work but Wally Lewis ever the magician there to finish it off So just four minutes of play remaining at halftime. That try could not really have come at a worse time for New Zealand. Giving six points away just before the break. Dale Shearer playing the ball, 12 metres from his own line. So the New Zealand task now must be, of course, to try and at least get a try back before halftime to stay within distance of the Australians. But at the moment, it's Hancock as he sprints down that left wing and no one is at home. Daryl Williams and the way goes Karen Walters. It's two on one here. Oh, great stuff from the Australians. They are starting to run riot. And it's these Queenslanders that are doing it. Karen Walters finishes off the try and it's 18 points to two. And it began way back in the New Zealand half, inside their own quarter line, in fact. The initial break made there by Meninga, and Michael Hancock, just 19 years of age, he took off like Carl Lewis, and poor old Clayton Friend didn't get anywhere near him. The pass to Kerrod Walters. Uh, Walters just ambles in for the try, a suggestion there might have been a forward pass there. Let's have a look at this again, Frank. Yeah, very, very close this one. This is a marginal, but I've always said that marginal passes always go to the attacking side. Now, this was the pass that looked as if it might have been forward. Yeah, not a good angle to see it, but uh, I had me doubts there, but, you know, the thing is that the, the blind, the Kiwis on the blind side are standing and waiting for the Australians to come, and you can't do that. You've got to get up, you've got to knock them over. Both sides have got to move up, not just one. So Meninga, who hasn't put a foot wrong all day with his goal kicking. And suddenly the New Zealanders are staring down the barrel of the good old-fashioned hiding after they played so well and so competitively for the first 20 minutes. But against this brilliant world champion side, if you make one mistake, you can pay very dearly for it. That's 20 points to two. Four out of four for Mel Meninga. And the Australians in the box seat with half time just a minute away. Well, Howie Tamati, what do you think now? Well, we're having a little bit of a problem with uh, Howie Tamati's microphone down there at half time. Maybe Michael Hancock might have stood on the cable when he took off down the touchline. However, or maybe Howie's just speechless with the way the Australians have suddenly taken New Zealand apart in the last five minutes. Half time now, just a minute away, as away come the Australians again. The New Zealand is really on the ropes at the moment at 20 points to two. And there will be no mercy from these Australians. Sitting in again, making the break, but the ball lost forward. New Zealand have it. Tony Kemp going down, but inside his own half. Mark Elia. Coming across from the left wing, trying to link up there with the, the right wing. Tony Iroh plays it to Tony Iroh at dummy half. Yes. 
So the capital of defensive laps have seen Australia convert those lapses into 12 points in what was a, a rather even and competitive game of rugby league at six, eight points to two. It's suddenly looking rather one-sided as we approach half-time at 20 points to two. As Clayton Friend kicks it deep. And Hancock, this young man who scored four tries in the state of origin this year. And just look at the way, this magnificent sidestep that he's got. Brushing away the tackles, but taken by Tony Eid all this time. And Kerrod Walters, breaking and running from dummy half. Takes play up 15 metres from the Australian line. Back to Bradley Clyde. Roach again. 16 and a half stone. 105 kilograms of Steve Roach. Now into injury time in the first half with the Australians ahead by 20 points to two. Three first half tries. And the tries coming in the first half to Curry, Lewis and Walters. As Daryl Williams running it from fullback. And so all the honours live with the Kangaroos at the end of the first 40 minutes of the first test here at Kiwi 2 Park in Christchurch. There it is, the sad news from a New Zealand point of view, but a great scoreline from the Australians, leading by 20 points to two. The try is coming from Curry in the 19th minute, Lewis in the 32nd, and Walters in the 35th. Mel Meninga with four out of four with his kicking. 20 points to two, New Zealand's only reply in the first half, a penalty to Kevin Edor. ...is of halfway. No score yet, with 11 minutes of the match gone. And here's the first real break as the Australians move the ball wide and it's gone loose. The break made by Paul Surinan, but Australia losing the ball. Surprising to see the Australians with such good ball skills and such a good scoring opportunity fumbling the ball there. This is what happens when you give them space. This is what happens. Have a look at it. Big Paul Surinan busts two tackles, three tackles, and gets the vital pass away, and Fatty Vorton's there to back up. And then the stray pass there. Good work, Hume, again free kick inside the Australian half. You just have to be so quick with these Australians if they get, they see half a gap, they're gone. This is what happened at Palmerston North on Tuesday night. They have this marvellous ability to seemingly create something out of nothing as we saw then. And it was really only that to spill pass that saved New Zealand's bacon. There's a chance to put the first points on the board. Just the start the Kiwis wanted. Kevin Eros swats the penalty, and New Zealand ahead by two points to nil after 12 minutes of play in the first half. And now some real pressure coming from the Australians. Here goes big Paul Sidonen, but he really ran off the support there. They're only a matter of 10 or 12 metres from the New Zealand line. Roach, Steve Roach looking for some support. Alexander, there's a gap here. Alexander, and yes, is that the first try? Tony Curry gets it. An air of inevitability about that is wave upon wave of Australian attack. And it was eventually Tony Curry there to finish the movement off. And Australia take the lead from... It's an excellent, an excellent build-up here from the Australians. They hit the short side here. You'll see the ball go out here from Alexander to Curry and Curry in the corner. Meninga, it's not a bad-looking kick. And suddenly the Australians, after being subjected to early pressure by the Kiwis, find themselves with a six-point lead. Yeah, Paul Seren, and he's coming into his own there. He'd be the player of the match up to this stage. Walters. Looking for Tony Curry. This elusive Queensland centre. Away goes Curry. Must be a try to Lewis. Oh, great play from the Kangaroos. The two Broncos. Tony Curry and Wally Lewis combined superbly there to completely hoodwink the New Zealand defence. And the second try of the match coming in the 32nd minute. And just watch this man, Curry. He is so elusive. The pass fed to him from Walters. 20 metres out. He steps out of one tackle. He steps out of another. The big gap opened up. And there he was, his skipper, Wally Lewis, on hand to take the pass. Eero came too late. And Wally Lewis gets the try. Meninga from a handy position makes it 14 points to two and the Australians now with a 12-point lead with half-time just a few minutes away. 
the New Zealand task now must be, of course, to try and at least get a try back before half time to stay within distance of the Australians. But at the moment, it's Hancock as he sprints down that left wing, and no one is at home. Daryl Williams, and away goes Karen Walters. It's 2 on 1 here. Oh, great stuff from the Australians. They are starting to run riot. And it's these Queenslanders that are doing it. Karen Walter finishes off the try, and it's 18 points to 2. So Welcome back to QE2 Park in Christchurch. 20 points to 2, New Zealand down at the break. Quick comment here from Howie Tamati. What do New Zealand have to do, Howie? Well, they've got to get their act together. Um, they've got to get the tackles low. They've got to move up, make sure they put the guys on the deck. And then they've got to stop stop these wraparounds and get the go forward going. You know, get the forwards hitting it up and make sure they're making yardage all the time. Interesting to see Gary Freeman on the field. His first game for about three months. Yeah, it'd be good to see. Maybe he can turn, turn the game around a little bit. OK, let's go back to Brendan Telfer. So Wally Lewis uh, restarts this first test match here at QE2 Park in Christchurch with his side, the world champions, and boy, did they play like that, particularly in the last 20 minutes of the first half. They were ahead by 20 points to two. A little fumble there from Barry Harvey. Another mistake coming from the Kiwis, and Australia with possession and immediately on attack. And there he is, Gary Freeman, who's having his first match, I think, since about the 27th of March, since he had that big suspension imposed on him. And what a moment it is for him, coming out here with his side behind by 20 points to two, having hadn't played any football for three months. But uh, Gary Freeman, nonetheless, would be absolutely delighted to be on the field. He was feeling really frustrated with the New Zealand team over the last couple of days at the thought he may not get any football for another three weeks because he's now eligible to play back for his Balmain club if he wants to. Uh, but probably a good move there on the part of Tank Gordon, Frank, to bring Freeman on. Yeah, good move. Uh, you know, he, he's a good organiser, this fella, and I know he hasn't had the match football, but he'll, he'll relish the conditions out there today. Tony Iro. There's Gary Freeman on for Clayton Friend, playing a dummy half. Sam Stewart. Well, I imagine these Kiwis got a good old-fashioned tongue lashing from Tank Gordon at halftime. I bet he read the right act to them, and they do look fired up despite the fact they're 18 points behind. Tony Kemp leaves it behind. There was a half gap there. He had Tony Iro with him. So it's now, I guess, a matter of pride for these Kiwis. It would be, I think, stretching their bounds of credibility to expect them to come back and win this match against this superbly organised Australian side. But nonetheless, they've got 40 minutes to rescue some pride, which took a battering at Eden Park last year. And there's a sense of deja vu descending upon us here in QE2 Park. Australia with possession. And there are some of the key statistics from the first half. Interesting to see that New Zealand have made a lot more tackles in Australia by 106 to 78. And leading the New Zealand tackle count was uh, Todd with 15. McGann made 16. Stewart 12 and 2 to 12. Well, the reason they've made more tackles is because they've made more mistakes. And, and this is why the Australians were hit by so many. New Zealand receive a penalty. Five minutes in the second half and about eight minutes inside their own half. Penalties shared at seven apiece from the first 40 minutes. Golding makes play up within, to within two metres of the Australian line, quarter line. Gary Freeman. And the pass goes astray, but fortunately Brendan Tutu was there before the Australians could snap it up. So New Zealand again with possession. Freeman, Gary Freeman sees a little gap. Fifth tackle coming up. Barry Harvey puts his head down and batters his way a few metres to the line. And the referee's whistle had gone. I think he might have spotted an Australian up inside the five metres. And New Zealand receive a penalty. It was 
Bradley Clyde, their second rower, who infringed. And New Zealand with a chance to put the first points on the board in the second up. But I think Williams is going to kick for touch. So New Zealand obviously looking for the tries. Sam Stewart doesn't get away from Karen Walters. Sam Becko marking him from the play the ball to Kevin Eero. And Curry and Alexander have him. And he loses it forward. And Gary Belcher has it for the Australians. Yeah, mistakes again. You just can't afford to make mistakes against a side like this. It's the 12th time New Zealand have dropped the ball when they've had possession in the match. And again, a five-metre one. You only get so many uh, chances in a game of rugby league, and you've got to take those chances when they come, and that's exactly what we're not doing out there today. Shane Cooper, who it was, who was spotted by Mr Tennant. Up inside the five-metre mark from play the ball in Australia with the penalty. Now with the, with the free kick, Sam Becko, who had a pretty quiet first half. It was Surinan and Roach that seemed to be taking the play mostly to the New Zealanders from the play the balls. Maybe they're keeping him back for the second half. Yeah, well, you know, you have a look at uh, big Sam Becko. He hasn't done much at all, but when these, uh, when these fellas, these Kiwis get uh, tired as they look at the moment, I think you'll see Sam Becko come into the game, especially near the try line. Twenty points to two. The score, no change from half time. The Australians scoring three first half tries to Curry, Lewis, and Walters as Steve Roach charges up over halfway. That's the fifth tackle. Lewis, Alexander, nicely taken there by Mel Meninga. And the ball has gone loose, and the Australians come away with it again. James Gording not looking too good on it out here in the centre of the field either. He's taken a heavy knock. Bradley Clyde pushes off one tackle. Greg Alexander couldn't get his pass away. Good smothering tackle there from Gary Freeman. Australians looking dangerous again in the early minutes of the second half. Bacco gets his pass away to Vorton. Here comes another try, I think. Vorton brought down right on the line. And a desperate moment there for New Zealand. Daryl Williams with a very good tackle on Vorton. Surinan. Again, there were big defensive gaps there among the New Zealanders as Borton probed the line. And a suggestion of a little knock on there from Gary Belcher trying to take that wide pass. And New Zealanders can breathe again, but boy, these Australians, they're not letting up. James Gordon, he's out on his feet out there at the moment. He's, he's had a real heavy knock. He's not looking too good. He could be replaced. James Gordon, the uh, New Zealand tight hit from. Daryl Williams to Elia, trying to run it out from just a few metres from the New Zealand line. Brendan Tutor, no way past Wally Lewis or Steve Roach. centre field on the New Zealand quarter line, Sam Stewart. And here comes the big downtowner, as they call it, from Darrell Williams. And tricky little bounce, it eludes Gary Belcher. He's inside his own quarter line. Doesn't get away from Tony Kemp. Dale Shearer. He's had a very quiet game so far. Didn't see much of the ball in the first half. And a long bullet pass to Mel Meninga, confronted by Shane Cooper and Brendan Tutor. Hancock to Belcher. Shane Cooper has him on the 22. Ten minutes of play in the second spell. And the halftime score remains. 20 points to two to the Australians. Lewis again, doesn't manage to free his pass this time, it's a good tackle on Lewis, the Australians on their corner line, Lewis to Greg Alexander, and Ilya leaving it for Daryl Williams, running it out from his own quarter line, runs straight into Karen Walters, 
Wally Lewis there as well. New Zealand, who have had very few real scoring opportunities in this match at all, which is testimony to the very solid defence of these Australians. They just It's not just a matter of them being able to move the ball at pace. Their defensive work today has been quite exceptional. Freeman. And again, there doesn't seem to be a great sense of direction or purpose about a lot of these New Zealand plays, Frank. No, the support's just not there. They're, they're going in, they're turning and popping a pass from the tackle, and the runners just aren't there. You've got to want to run against these guys. You've got to want to run. Dale Shearer finding the ground a little bit soft. Belcher. Good support play here from Shearer. This is virtually the Queensland backline, of course, that's playing in this test match this afternoon. Only Greg Alexander at halfback is a non-Queenslander. And the other five outside of him. All members of that uh, highly successful Queensland side that won the state of origin. And this could be the first win opportunity. And away goes Mark Ely with the intercept. And he's got the pace on Curry. So something for the New Zealanders in the crowd to cheer about at last. Mark Elia, who took the intercept, he took it from a stationary position, but he still managed to work up enough speed to clear away from the cover defence. But hey, and New Zealand back, well, I guess not in the match as far as winning it is concerned, but that will give them and do them the world of good. Now look at the pass from Alexander, beautifully taken by Elia, pulling it down from his fingertips, and look how quickly he exploded. He hit top pace very quickly. Now Curry, some sensible play here from Tony Curry as he kept them wide. He wasn't going to let him go under the posts, but Elia gets the try. It's 20 to 6. Yeah, good ball skills here, Mark Elia, and he's no slug. This fella can go. Here it is, the ball skills turn. Hit for home, Mark. Way you go. There's no way they're going to get him. Shut the gate. So now Kevin Iro has a chance to add the extra two points. And that, I'm sure, will do the sagging spirits of the New Zealanders the world of good. They really must have been on the ropes when they trudged off this field at half-time, down by 20 points to two. But having posted that try, their first try of the match, I'm sure their spirits will start to lift. And Iro, judging from the reaction by the crowd, he's made a bit of a hash of it. It's 20 points to six. They're still a long way behind. A reminder that this coverage of the second half of the New Zealand Australia International coming to you from QE2 Park in Christchurch is brought to you by Lion Red Limited. So there he is, Mark Elia, 26-year-old from Canterbury Bankstown today playing in his ninth test. This is the man who originally went to England to further his cricket career some years ago and finished up playing for the Kent Evicta side in the second division there and now a regular member of the Kiwi Rugby League team. Sam Stewart, <laughs> he's really fired up, not intimidated at all by those enormous big Australian forwards it's stationed in front of him as he charged into them. So I guess any complacency that there might have been in the Australian camp after that uh, half-time scoreline would have been well and truly ridden by now as a result of that try. Todd to Stewart again on the quarter line. Darrell Williams kicking deep, but good positional play by Belcher. He was waiting there underneath it. Gets away from one tackle. Shearer, such marvellous understanding amongst these Australian backs because they, a lot of them play together for the Brisbane Broncos and having just had those three state of origin matches as well. And it's clearly showing up in this match. Always seems to be an Australian there to keep the ball alive. Steve Roach again. He has a bit of a reputation for one not always able to control his temper and his aggression, but he's been on uh, perfect behaviour so far this afternoon. Meninga. Haven't seen much of Mel Meninga in this match so far. He's done everything that's been required of him in the goal-kicking department with four out of four. And 
the word from Molly Lewis to Dale Shearer was to kick. Wasn't a bad bomb either. Fourteen minutes into the second spell. The only points since half-time are try to Mark Edia. Shane Cooper plays it back to, to Brent Todd on the quarter line. Vorton. We haven't seen much of the Australians so far in the first 15 minutes of the second spell, but they were pretty quiet when the match started as well, just settling down for the first 15 minutes. But boy, when they explode, not great to watch. Three excellent first half tries. Waters again, a little scissors movement with Wally Lewis. Karen Walters, Walters, just a metre short when he ran into a brick wall. That was a superb tackle there by Mark Elia because Walters really was at full steam. Surinan trying to find his way through that last line of defence. Referee has spotted an infringement, has he? No, he's turnover. Close shave there for Sam Stewart. He managed to get it on the second attempt. New Zealand running it out from their own line. Sam Stewart again. James Golden. <laughs> and little Barry Harvey, he went backwards there when he ran into big Sam Bacco. Yes, I'd like to see the Kiwis throw the ball wider here because there are the gaps on the flank. There's a big Australian condensed defence in the middle, but there are big gaps on the flank. I'd like to see the ball thrown wider quicker. A very good kick there from Darrell Williams. So it wasn't made any easier for Shearer by the fact that the Australians are looking into the setting sun in the second half. And the sun is still shining brilliantly here in Christchurch today on this cloudless day in front of a crowd of 15 or 16,000 people. Probably the biggest crowd to watch a game of rugby league in the city for 20 or 30 years. Australians with it. A long pass. And Kemp looking for the intercept. Now there's a little bit of a hole in the New Zealand defence as Belcher makes a run from the quarter line. To Curry at dummy half to Horton. Tony Curry, the man that played a hand in the first two tries the Australian scored. He scored one himself, then set up Wally Lewis with the second try. Dale Shearer. Wally Lewis to Steve Roach. As he breaks through the tackle of McGann, who's gone down again. Just out of picture, there he is. Number 11, Hugh McGann, who's taken a lot of knocks today as Grant Gallagher, the New Zealand physio, comes on the field. Play continues. Alexander with a little kick gets there for Alexander. He's got Walters with him, but Darrell Williams took the intercept. Greg Alexander, perhaps just a little too smart for his own good there. He had a man outside of him who was unopposed, and now it's New Zealand coming away with it. Sam Stewart, for well, the Australians, certainly threw a try away there. Freeman. Cooper. Moving it wide, the Aero Brothers. Tony, he had Kevin outside of him. Tries to play it himself, but Curry quickly finishes that idea off. And the pass is wide again to Stewart. Tries to fend off Ollie Lewis. Greg Alexander will be kicking himself there for not passing. Perhaps he didn't know that Walters was out to his right. Kicked the ball straight into the arms of Daryl Williams. Cooper kicking in behind those Australian backs. It's not a bad little kick either. Alexander Belcher. This is what the Kiwis have got to do here, Brendan. They've got to try little chip kicks in, 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 in the wider ball. They, they, they're not going to break this Australian defence just by flowering up the middle now. They've got to throw caution to the wind. Australia ahead by 20 points to six. Midway through the second spell. As away come the Australians again, Walters, he's got Shearer with him. And they're moving it wide up to the 22. 
That's Greg Alexander taking on the New Zealand quarter line. A good tackle there by Hugh McGann, who, despite the number of knocks that he's had, is not going off. Clyde. Clyde. Sitting in. Inside the New Zealand quarter line. It's the last tackle. Wally Lewis. The little grab a kick, and here we go again. This time it's Cooper. Where's the support, Freeman? But the Australian cover defence really regrouped very quickly there. Shane Cooper perhaps just lacking a yard of pace because he was in the clear. Yeah, pity it wasn't Mark Elia. <laughs> yeah, they had plenty of real estate ahead of him. And you'll see the little intercept gathered in by Cooper. Now, he was in the clear here, and Gary Freeman was following him, and uh, Cooper just didn't manage to clear away from the Australian defence. New Zealand ahead on the penalty count by 10 to 9 from the free kick. Golding again. James Golding. Back in the New Zealand team after a four-year absence, playing in only his second test today. Played his first against France in 1985. The New Zealand again probing at the Australian defence, almost up to the Australian quarter line in centre field. The only points in the second half, an unconverted try by Mark Elia. It's 20 points to six to the Australians. Freeman. Brent Todd. Really difficult to break this Australian defence. They yield nothing. Yeah, they could, they, they could have put a bomb up here, right into the sun. Freeman. No, see, just a lack of organisation there. And Turnover, last tackle. They seems inexplicable. The this level of football inside your opponent's quarter that you would give possession away with a turnover but they have and away come the australians just what gary freeman was trying to do out there we do not know but the australians now with possession bradley clyde makes another 15 meters what a marvelous debut he's had for a 19 year old seems assured of a long and permanent place in the Australian team for many years to come. Alexander, Lewis, Meninga. Meninga, he pushes Kempel, but not Sam Stewart or James Golding. Walkers again. Wally Lewis. Gary Belcher. Tony Iro, who decides to let the ball bounce. The Australians who can't move until he's moved at least five metres. Why Euro never went in and took that ball I, on the full, I do not know, but however. Darrell Williams, Harvey, a dummy half, Freeman, Sam Stewart. Twenty-four minutes of play in the second half. Australia ahead by twenty points to six. They haven't added to their half-time score. Freeman, Cooper, again chipping the ball over the back, waiting underneath. It was Hancock. He took it well. As Tony Kemp arrived there as well, he didn't flinch at all. An interference, I think the referee has judged on uh, Cooper by on, on the Hancock. So the Australians receive a penalty. So Lewis looking into the sun, just inside the New Zealand half. Takes play up almost to the New Zealand quarter line. From there, the free kick. Garrett Walters to Steve Roach. Alexander, this is a move they practiced time and time again at uh, practice yesterday at St Andrews College here in Christchurch. The double scissors movement as Borton again. Yeah, this is where the Australians get dangerous here. 
They'll just take three or four plays up, and then they'll have a, a, a move, plan move on. Lewis couldn't get his pass to Kerrod Walters, and diving on the ball was Barry Harvey. Cooper missing out Elia. Cooper, Freeman. Cooper of well, the New Zealanders still trying to run the ball one down. There's a bit of room here for the Eros. Away goes Kevin Eroy. He's got his brother with him on the outside. But oh, again, the defensive mistake. Brendan Tutor, well, he had the line ahead of him, but for the 16th time today, we see the New Zealanders dropping the ball. And he's terribly disappointed because there really was a try on there. Maybe Kevin Eroy should have moved the ball to his right to his brother Tony. Yeah, Tony was just a little bit too far behind. It went to the right man, but we've got to take those passes. Just, we've put down too many in this test match today. Clyde. Walters. Back out. 26 minutes into the second scroll. About 15 minutes of the match remaining. Roach, now that looked a little suspect on Roach, but the referee, Mr. Tennant, says no. Play can continue. And Steve Roach not terribly impressed with that tackle on him by Sam Stewart. As the way come the Australians again. Surinan, there are men on here for the Australians. Wilkes, he had the men on the left, but he was looking for support on the right. And New Zealand had time to regroup. Belcher, Meninga, good tackle on Meninga, but he's still got his pass away. Curry, you've got to watch this man. Curry. And his look-alike, Dale Shearer. And the Australians look as if they just uh, lost their concentration. A lapse there as the ball went loose. No one seemed to want it. So James Gordon said, thank you, I'll have it. And New Zealand come away with it with a new six tackle count. Elia. I think must, a lot of credit must go to the New Zealand defence in the second half to keep this straight in scoreless. Yes, the New Zealanders can take uh, some, I guess, kudos from the second spell in as much that they've kept the Australians scoreless and have added a try themselves. Only points in the second spell, a Mark Elia try, an intercept from halfway. Now Freeman. Freeman having a little probe, but taken in the tackle there by Tony Curry. Darrell Williams kicking for that corner flag. It's not a bad looking kick. fullback who really has been one of the Kiwis today who can be very pleased with his performance at a super game from fullback. His long deep probing kicks which have enabled the New Zealanders to exert some pressure on the Australians in a scrum to take place inside the Australian quarter line. And Alexander and he's lost it. But I think he's penalised Brendan Tutor for being offside, coming around too quickly, and so Wally Lewis has a chance to take some of that pressure off the Australians as he takes play back towards halfway. Yes, again, you know, the, the mistakes, they just keep tallying up, tallying up, and it just keeps the Australians ahead in the scoreboard. So Vorton, to Walters at dummy half, to Sam Bacco, still got his pass away. The sun starts to extend its shadow across the park here at QE2. It's Lewis to Belcher, the dummy to Lewis, and Belcher continues up towards the quarter line. Surinan up over the quarter line, Paul Surinan. 
and what will the Australians do here? They're looking for Wally Lewis. He's out to the left. There he is at the bottom of the picture. And it's the little grubber kick, is it? Yes, but it's too deep. No pressure there at all on Williams. New Zealand will restart from the 22. Freeman. Into the last 10 minutes of this first test, the first of three to be played over the next few weeks here in New Zealand, the second test at Rotorua next Sunday, and the third at Mount Smart. All three test matches this year being played at non-rugby league venues. This one has been a marvellous success with a very big crowd here. Certainly the number of people here today, far more than the Eddington Showgrounds could accommodate. Tutor trying the little chip kick, but into the arms of Alexander. Hancock decides to have a run. Kerrig Walters. Borton, Fatty Borton as they call him. He doesn't seem to be at all offended by that uh, name that they have for him. But you may have even heard the expression a few times from our effects microphones as his teammates call out to him. Steve Roach has made a successful comeback to the Australian side today. He hadn't had much of a season as away goes Sheridan and Paul Sheridan scoring a try and that try has been coming all afternoon time and time again he's broken tackles and the Australians post their first try of the second spell that's 24 to 6. How many times today have we seen this from Surinan the pass from Wally Lewis standing up in the tackle he had an instinctive knowledge of exactly where Surinan was broke out of one two three very weak tackles including that last attempt from Darrell Williams 24 to 6. Yeah, well, just have a look at this inside pass, reverse pass here from, from Lewis. This is just straight power from Surinan. This is the power of the man. He deserves this try. He's looked for this try the whole match. And, and to me, he is the player of the match, Paul Surinan. Well-deserved try. There's Paul Surinan, this 24-year-old, who was actually lost to rugby league temporarily back in 1983 when he won a football scholarship to the University of Hawaii. And it's not hard to see why. Immense strength of the man. Meanwhile, Mel Meninga is having a good day here at QE2 Park. Five out of five today for Meninga. Four of them have been fairly simple kicks, but he also converted that try from near the touchline, and it's 26 to 6. So we look at that try again, and just look at the creative genius here of Wally Lewis. He knew exactly where Surinan was. Stood up in the tackle. Perfect tackle. Perfect pass to Surinan as he brushed away those rather weak New Zealand tackles and strided in confidently for the try. We notice a few of the fans starting to leave QE2 Park in Christchurch as they sense the fate of this match is well and truly sealed. And I guess any remote hopes that New Zealand might have had of staging a remarkable comeback were extinguished with that try by Surinam. 26 to 6, one try apiece in the second spell. Australians may well be making a replacement that looks like a Michael O'Connor who's stripping down on the Australian bench. Meanwhile, back on the field of play, Stephen Roach to Surinan. And again, Surinan makes the break. He's in the clear. He's only got Daryl Williams. He's looking for some support. Finds it in the form of Bort, but the pass was misdirected. Hancock. And the pace of this match has really slowed down. Australia moving the ball as wide to Meninga. Meninga lost it forward. I get the impression, Frank, that both of these two teams would rather like to hear the sound of the final hooter at the moment. There's some pretty tired men out there, particularly in the New Zealand camp. 
some very tired men. I, I, I understand Paul Serenin's a policeman at home. I wish he had to stay there. <laughs> Darrell Williams. He's got Tony Ear all there with him, but he drifts away from him and take it in the tackle by new man on the field, Dave Trewella. And away goes Ear off to Elliot. Could be number two here for Mark Elliott. Shearer giving chase. Can the momentum get there? He's just a metre short, and it needed the speed of Dale Shearer, who really flew after Elliot. And the referee, I think, has blown his whistle as he penalised the Australians. No. Nope. Williams. The Kiwis would love another try here. Gary Freeman. No way through there, Mr. Freeman, as he runs straight into Sam Becco. And I think Becco has been penalised for not allowing Freeman to play the ball. So the New Zealanders receive a penalty, but they take the tap. Todd. So Mark Ilya within an ace of scoring his second runaway try. Tony Kemp can't get past Lewis. And into touch they go. So the scrum to go down about to seven or eight metres from the Australian line. Into the last five minutes of this test. test. Australia ahead by 26 to 6. Each team with one try in the second spell. As Greg Alexander feeding the scrum. Gets his pass away to Gary Belchip. Lewis. Dale Shearer, the man who made tremendous ground to pull down Mark Ely. He must have been giving him the best part of seven or eight metres. He still made the tackle, a metre from the line, as away comes Belshot Lewis, looking for the speedsters, and he finds one in the form of Dale Shearer. Look at the speed of this man. And Michael O'Connor, there he is, uh, who's on the field, who fumbled the ball. And New Zealanders receive a penalty. Sam Cooper having a long run on his own. Kevin Eerdorf, the New Zealanders determined to score another try before this match is over. But another error this time from Gary Freeman losing the ball forward. And the Australians have possession. We haven't seen a lot of Kevin Eero today, but what we have seen is just straight class. He makes his half gaps, but we've got to have the support runners with him. Thrown forward by Walters. And the referee sees there is no advantage to New Zealand, and so the scrum to take place just inside the Australian half. Howie Tamati, what's it look like from down there on the touchline? Well, I think the New Zealand side can take a lot of heart from this, um, this second half performance. Um, I would hope the New Zealand selectors don't panic too much. Uh, once they got their act together and started tackling, you know, they've, they've done all right this half. Obviously, the Australians have uh, made a few busts, but you know, we've had our chances as well. Um, I think it's been a really learning, a learning day for the New Zealand rugby league side today, and uh, let's hope in the second test they really get their act together. Kemp. Kemp. Good run there from Tony Kemp. Rather undoes much of his good work by slipping the ball to his opposite number, Curry, and away come the Australians from inside their own half. 26 to 6. 20 points to 2 at half time. One try apiece in the second spell. And as Howie Tumati said, something perhaps for the New Zealanders to build on from the second half effort as they look forward to the next two tests. They were completely outplayed in the latter stages of the first spell, allowing the Australians to run in three tries in 16 minutes and seeing the score expand from 2 all to 20 to 2 in the last 20 minutes of the first spell. But they've come back well in the second spell. And the created a few scoring opportunities for themselves which we never saw in the first half as well yeah sure they've created quite a few opportunities but you must take the football there and score with the football and this is it we just put down too much ball to win this match today but they have showed a lot of heart in the second half Thank <laughs> you. 
looks like uh, another replacement has been made in the Australian forward line. I think Maguire's on for Roach. Gary Freeman plays it for Tony Iroa at the dummy half to Shane Cooper. Cooper, who's had a pretty good game at standoff half for New Zealand as well. Plays it off the red carpet. Hugh McGann staying on to the end. And that's going to be too deep, is it, from Hugh McGann, the New Zealand captain, who really hasn't played a major part in the second spell due to a couple of heavy knocks he suffered in the first half and another in the second spell. But the fact that he's remained on the field, I think, has probably been an important factor for the New Zealand effort. He's such an inspired leader. Kerrod Wolf is a dummy half. Takes the play from Maguire. Bradley Clyde takes it up to 10 metres outside the quarter line. Into the last couple of minutes of this match. And the Australians, who have certainly wrapped up this first test and will take a 1-0 lead as they go into the second test in Rotorua in a week's time. Greg Alexander, I think a little surprised to receive that pass. There's, there's the hooter for the full-time sound here at Takiwi Two Park. And so the Kangaroos, the defending world champions, and boy, do they play like world champions as well. Too good for the Kiwis today, winning by 26 points to six. The win was really constructed in the last 15 minutes of the first half when they ran in three tries from Cowie, Curry, Lewis and Walters. It was 20 points to two at half time. An improved performance by the New Zealanders in the second spell. A try by Elia. Surinan replied for the Australians. And in the end, it was 26 to six to the Australians. Coverage of today's Rugby League International between New Zealand and Australia has been brought to you in association with Lion Red Limited. So as the crowd makes their way out of QE2 Park from this historic occasion, the first time an international rugby league match has been played here at this venue, and it certainly has been a big success judging by the public support for the match. Disappointed, no doubt, with the Kiwi effort in the first half, but there's no doubt about this Australian side. They're worthy world champions, Frank Endicott. Well, I don't know whether we played so bad. I think we've got to give credit to this uh, this Australian side. This is one of the best sides I've seen in a long time. But, you know, if you allow them to run and allow them to get the passway and the tackle, they're made to look better, you know, maybe even better than what they are. But uh, overall, I can be pleased with the Kiwi effort. They certainly improved their showing in the second spell, and I think uh, Hugh McGann might be down there with Grant Nisbet at the moment. Grant. Yes, thanks, uh, Brendan. Uh, Hugh McGann, commiserations, but a very good effort in the second half for New Zealand. Well, we had to tighten them up um, out wide because that's where they were making their breaks, and uh, we tightened that up, but uh, unfortunately their big force had to take control. They used their size to an advantage, and uh, it's something we may have to look at for the next week, but uh, we've got a week to do something. I was proud of the, the way that the guys didn't give up, but uh, we need more penetration, we need some more concentration, and hopefully we can develop that this week. Were well, the Aussies as good as you thought they'd be? Oh, just as good. We always knew they were going to be a very tough side. Uh, they've got the ability out wide and in close to, to do some damage, and uh, as I said, we've got a lot of work to do. Today was, was a test in itself for us. We hadn't had a game together. We uh, tried to get combinations through the week. It only started to come right for us the last two training sessions, and unfortunately that probably wasn't enough for us. I know you lost by 20 points, uh, Hugh, but did the tactics go according to plan? What, what did you actually set out to do in the game? Well, actually, we had to try and get the ball a little wider. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had two plays to try and take it up the centre, but unfortunately that didn't work for us, and we were always on the back foot. But uh, like I say, it was, it was a test in itself for us. It's something that we have to work on. We'll look at this week and hopefully overcome the next week. And you reckon you've still got uh, the team that can beat the Aussies? I'm sure we have. We proved uh, today that we can make the breaks. It's a matter of uh, backing up and... Uh, holding the, the, the players down in their own quarter, the opposition in their own quarter. We gave away silly mistakes, dropped ball again. We took the pressure off them and put it on ourselves by giving away those mistakes when we had them dead on their line. And as I said, it's discipline more for us than for them. What about yourself? You took a few hard knocks in the game. Oh, that's just part of the course. It's uh, something I um, hope to get over in the next couple of days and probably pretty myself up over the next day. So. Good on you, Hugh. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, mate. 
Well said, Hume again. Yeah, I guess a rugby league test is not exactly a dinner party. Hume again, a rather composed and rather eloquent Hume again there, summarising the match with Grant Nisbet. So 26 points to six, the Australians have won. A 20-point victory now. Frank Ginnicott, when a team loses a test match by 20 points, you start to think that there must be some changes for the next test team. Can you see any changes in the Kiwi team for Rotorua? I hope not. I hope they stick with the same players. I, they showed enough out there today to warrant uh, selection for the second test. And, they, they, you know, I would stick with them if it was me. Thank you, Frank Endicott. So just repeating the news from Kiwi 2 Park in Christchurch, the Australians have taken the first test in this best-of-three match test series between the Kangaroos and the Kiwis, winning convincingly here at Kiwi 2 Park by 26-6. to 6.